soup. History does not remember blood. It remembers names. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, joined here today with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to talk about the House of the Dragon, episode three, second of his name. You all right? Hmm? Okay. That's a weird pose. I was just scratching my ear. You, sound like you look like you were taking an important call. You don't have an <laughs> ear thing in your... No? No, built in. I got the, uh, was it the Neuralink? This whole time, it was just somebody else giving you all your points? Yeah. Okay. Well, I have a gripe to pick with that person. <laughs> few gripes over the years because normally i trust your opinions on shows and movies but uh the way you slandered Mad Men for these past five years i never that's one of my favorite shows i never slandered Mad Men. i said i couldn't get through a season but it made me want to smoke cigarettes and drink whiskey and wear suits boring. all the time when i was in college what, do I, was, what, did, what did i know and that's a good point yeah, yeah. maybe rewatch it now yeah like it even less <laughs> <laughs> and like i said we are here to talk about episode three of house of the dragon our spoiler discussion no Nash, no Teddy today. Both had, uh, life gets in the way of nerd soup sometimes. That's no excuse. True enough. But we are here, and, uh, of course, you can listen to this on all the places you get your podcasts, or you could just watch it, listen along on YouTube, and follow us on social media at Nerd Soup, Bo Soup, Nerd Soup Monkey, all the social medias out there, so if you want to hear our thoughts that aren't related to House of the Dragon, not many people do. But sometimes we talk about House of the Dragon there too, so oh, yeah, double dipping. No, oh, someone like tweeted at Game us. It's like so. it's like all you guys do is House of the Dragon stuff. Let me know when you get back to the good stuff. I definitely appreciate. No, it. I, I took that as a compliment. It's like wow, right. people who don't like the, everyone yeah, looks at right. us like Game of Thrones guys it's talk about mostly the Game of Thrones stuff. Though. Talk about you know dragons. So yeah, we like other things. Yeah, like Mad Men. Might do a Mad Men revisited. Imagine that we just stopped right in the middle of House of the Dragon, went straight into Mad Men. Can we smoke cigarettes and drink whiskey while we record? I would be upset if we didn't. I think just watching it, I have lung cancer from the secondhand smoke. Third hand, I guess. Yes. And I have just from first hand. <laughs> you know what? I was surprised to see you know, just getting into the episode now. I was surprised to see uh, some mixed reactions. I think most people were positive towards this episode, but I saw some criticisms of the pacing that it continues to be a slow burn. And I don't know, maybe it's just because I'm such a fan of the world and big fan of Game of Thrones that I'm just happy to see these characters sort of come to life. And I wonder if season one had some of those criticisms as well. Season one of Game of Thrones is one of the slower seasons because there's so much to establish to set up. So for me, this episode it felt like a breeze. I mean, I don't think it was just the flawless masterpiece of television that some people think it is with the high ratings on IMDb, but I thought it basically matched the quality of the first two, which I was was a big fan of, so. Yeah, me too. I think these first three have all been really good, and I've enjoyed every single one of them. The show never, or Game of Thrones, never really ever felt slow to me. I just always enjoyed the little details and the conversations they were having and how the story progresses through those conversations. We're doing the revisited on season six. And one of the things in early season six that we kind of talk about is there isn't there's a lot like there's a lot of scenes, but most of those scenes aren't too significant when it comes to moving the the pieces or not effectively. Whereas I feel like here, every scene holds a lot of weight to it and it progresses the story along and that's what's been intriguing to me is that you know every conversation between whether it be Alicent and Rhaenyra or Rhaenyra and her father the king and uh, Alicent like it sets up something else and I think where some people might find that boring I think that's my favorite part of the show I've even with the original series the big moments were always a, a spectacle and they were had you on the edge of your seat but what made the show so great was those moments yeah, and I think there's a lot of to uh, there's a lot to pick up on rewatch, like the conversations between Allison and Rhaenyra, and this is you know, things that people noticed on Twitter after the episode that I'm just basically stealing from the timeline. But Allison uh, saying, uh, "Love stealing Twitter points." Yeah, rappers do it a lot. Apparently, they they steal Twitter points or for lines in their songs. <laughs> it's interesting. But when Allison says in front of Rhaenyra that Aegon came quickly, it, he didn't really make a fuss. Unintentionally, she reminds Rhaenyra of what happened to Emma because for Emma, it was it was always a struggle, and then eventually she lost her life. So it's those little details in the conversations that really what happened. I'm just no. Nothing. What are you laughing at? I'm not. I'm not hiding that. I'm not cutting that out. 
<laughs> I want the people to know. And there are even lines with uh, Rhaenyra saying, I, I don't want to go out on the hunt because I don't like the way the animals scream, but Viserys is the one setting this up. But when it's his turn to kill the stag, he hesitates, and he doesn't really have a grip on things. But when it push comes to shove for Rhaenyra, she takes out that boar without hesitation. So it speaks to her kind heart, but the assert- assertiveness of that character. When she needs to get something done, she can do it, whereas Viserys is more hesitant. Uh, and I wanted to make this point on the first review, I totally forgot to say it, but the performance of a man that's coming apart at the seams is what you're seeing with this character. He is just being ripped and pulled, and eventually it's going to end up... Another thing that Twitter noticed that I didn't, he's missing fingers. So oh, now yeah. he's, he's literally coming apart. Yeah, I didn't even really pick up. I was like looking for it, but I it must have been a quick shot that yeah. I uh, missed, but... Yeah, he literally is falling apart. Right, and those two characters, I mean, Rhaenyra is, it, it, it is similar what they're both going through, but it's a lot of pouting in this episode for Rhaenyra. This is Princess Rhaenyra, right? I'm not going to listen to what Allison says unless it's a king's command, or I'm going to run away and have Kristen Cole just sort of escort me throughout the woods. I'm going to be defiant at every single turn. You know, when Viserys, uh, she complains about Jason Lannister and Viserys says, yeah, he kind of reminds me of you. That look she gives him is like, fuck you. But you mentioned this in the first review. The daughter-dad dynamic has been pretty great. Probably the strongest relationship of the show so far. Yeah, and I, I think that's my favorite scene of the episode is when they have that conversation in the small council room where he, you know, they kind of just have a real conversation. Something that it doesn't look like they've had in years or <laughs> ever since King Viserys chose to ma- marry Alison Hightower. So... Um, him kind of reassuring her that she will not be um, removed as heir and he will hold his word and giving her the freedom to choose her own husband and ensuring the confidence in her, but also telling her that you more than anybody should know what a king has to do. And this is the decisions I made and you got to be okay with some of those. Yeah, it seems like she's a character who's always understood what's expected of her, but because things have become so complicated recently... She's acting more like a child rather than a princess. So she tells him, you sh- you know, if this was about strengthening House Targaryen, you would have married Lena. So don't push this on me. This is what we need to do for the benefit of the house. And that's why he does give her that freedom like he had to choose Alicent to go out and choose your own person. But it- it's a conversation they needed and it does come off as a very genuine interaction, like I said, between dad and daughter. And it's when those fa- family dynamics get interrupted by the royal dynamics. Kristen says there are plenty of people who would change positions with you guys, but heavy lies the crown. And sometimes your neck gets a little, there's a little crick in it, you know, need a nice massage. I mean, the throne doesn't help either. No, it doesn't. You got a heavy crown, the throne, no back support on that thing. It's pricking you. I wouldn't be king just for that. Yeah, that's a nice symbolism. Not a comfortable job. <laughs> very, very explicit. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, you can't just throw a pad down. I'm sure someone could. Build a recliner. Like I said on the first review, just Millie Alcock, Patty Considine, like their performances. It's. <sighs> We keep saying it, but when they do make that switch, I'm going to miss M- Millie, uh, Millie yeah. Alcock so much. And Emma Darcy, I think they're going to really embody the role and do a great job too. But it, just getting to know this character for a handful of episodes and then that's it. Well, I can't, you know, it's obviously they're changing performers. There, there's going to be an adjustment period. But if they keep the character the same, if she's got that same wit, the same sassiness to her, the regalness, the gracefulness, those are qualities. The last, the latter two are it's sort of like the it factor. You either have it or you don't. But we will see. And I think that, you know, it's a long process to get the two best performers for this one character. But yeah, like I said, uh, Millie, Millie Alcox got all that, all the stuff that makes a, a princess. You know, it was, I mentioned it on our Revisited about Daenerys it's just that vibe, you know, that's something that you can't, the regalness, the gracefulness, the, uh, just the, the air, the aura around that character. You, you look at the way that they were looking at her when she comes back after killing the boar, you know, they were like, yeah, hell yeah, this chick is fucking awesome. Yeah. And the way Jason Lannister spits game to her, you know, she's a, she's a fucking princess, man. And Patty Considine, yeah. <laughs> the way he's been carrying himself, the way he talks too, I just love his accent. It feels like he's struggling to get every word out because he's so unsure of himself. And seeing him in this drunken state, bitter, very irritable in this episode. And he says he just wants to make Rhaenyra happy. But every time he does something that pleases one person, it pisses off another. <laughs> so the politics of this show have been way more, I don't want to necessarily say complicated uh, than the first season of Game of Thrones, but 
I, I guess because it's it's coming from such a personal place. There were so many moving parts in season one. For this show, it's it's just the Targaryens. So they put you up close and personal with how hard these decisions have been on them. That's a good point because it is only focusing on pretty much one family. Well, multiple families, but every other family we really introduced to is interconnected with the Targaryens in some shape or form. And the settings are all very close where... Um, most of the characters are in the same area or they're in groups where, you know, that original series, you were all over the map at times. Right. So, yeah, you could see, obviously, people are making their plays for power, but the reactions to the decisions are more um, people feel slighted or feel betrayed rather than just these power grabs or scheming. And there's definitely some things going on behind the scenes, but I think a lot of it is a very personal dynamic, which I enjoy. Yeah, right. I, uh, you know, in the beginning of the episode when Tylan is telling Viserys, your brother's war is failing. Uh, House Valerion is taking incredible losses. They're sowing dissent within the ranks. And Viserys is like, yeah, whatever. It's, it's very personal when it, <laughs> when it comes to supporting or not supporting your brother. So when Damon gets the letter at the end, you know, he doesn't even have to say a word. You pick up everything from the character's physical actions, but he, he's pissed. He feels probably betrayed once again. You know, now you're going to come to the rescue when it looks like you could save the day after I've been out here putting in the fucking work. I just have to comment the way Matt Smith carries himself too, man. When he's reading that letter, he's got such a punch. It's not even a punchable face, a punchable body. Just the way he, he, just the way he gathers himself, the way he uh, holds himself is just, he's just such a prick. I think that's more disrespectful. See, oh, you have a punchable face, okay, but if it's like, I see you and I just want to rail you with body shots. Right, yeah, just shots to the fucking rib. Stop standing like that. Why, why are you standing like that? You think you're better than me? Why, because you have a dragon? Yeah. Goofy ass body? I love Caraxes, actually. It reminded me of uh, the dragons you see in Asian mythology. Right, the long bodies. Long body, slinky, yeah, Mm -hmm. just kind of slithering through the air. He's becoming my favorite, man. Uh, I I like the underdog. You know, everybody was picking on him for being goofy and having a long neck, but I I like that big goofy boy. But, you know, going back to Viserys, Daemon, Rhaenyra, it's all personal. So every decision is going to be, it's like the Godfather. It's not personal, it's just business. Well, it's almost impossible to separate the two when you all have the same last name. And with the birth of Aegon II, it doesn't get more personal than, than that. Most of the realm and most of his advisors and the people around him look at him as the heir. And as a father, as a king, what decision do you make? Do you stand your word? Like, do you stick with your word? You know, and if you do choose one over the other, you're basically screwing over one of your child, uh, children in favor of the other. Give it to Aegon. Well, how do you think Rhaenyra is going to feel? And if you keep it with Rhaenyra, I'm sure when Aegon gets older, he might feel slighted as well. Yeah, and I think with a, a lot of people are sympathetic towards Viserys, even though he's making a lot of bad decisions because he's showing remorse. He's being open about the things that he may or may not regret. Some of the decisions he's making, maybe they are going to be looked at as mistakes. So that's why I think there is, you know, an actual love between Viserys and Rhaenyra. And he wants to do the right thing by her, but it's proven to be so difficult. You know, we see a lot of people were wondering if maybe Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole spent the night together in quotation marks. I don't I didn't really pick up on that. I don't know. I think there would have been more of a hint. Yeah. towards it in either way but there's definitely a camaraderie that they are building a friendship it felt to me more like a friendship you know when she's 15 14 she sees the pretty knight so she puts him on the king's guard but maybe at this point she's matured a bit more but maybe that will evolve into something more than just friendship yeah i think the mo- like the conversations i had i think i really enjoyed especially him saying that you know people would kill to be you and put like switch places and be a princess but when you really are in her shoes you realize like sure privileged lifestyle rich can has immense power named the fucking heir of the seven kingdoms but with that comes a lot a lot of baggage you know i i wouldn't blame her if she would want to switch places with someone like Kristen, have his type of upbringing when you can you don't really have those pressures you can marry who you want you can really do what you want. Yeah, on rewatch, a line that stuck out to me is she's complaining about Jason Lannister. And the first thing Kristen says is, you want me to kill him? <laughs> she's like, oh, Kristen, you dead ass? I'll fucking kill him. You serious? <laughs> I'll fucking kill him right now. Kill Tylen too. That man is ready to kill. Because uh, they saw the white stag and it, it set up the music, the sunset as a positive omen. He slowly pulls out his knife. I'm going to ruin this fucking moment. Yeah, like I said before, if she, if she brought that back, I think she just she's queen. 
don't I don't want her to kill the poor animal, but you know how easy it is to trick people in medieval times with omens. You know who would have done that? A character like Tywin, a character like Cersei. That settles it. I don't give a fuck how awesome Aegon ends up being. All of a sudden, he's a D1 prospect. Eh, maybe he should be king. His little baby. <laughs> right, but she lets the uh, the innocent animal go. So sometimes that good-hearted nature can come back to bite you on the ass, right? I can't believe they consider that hunting. It's literally like when the rich people go to Africa and they basically set it up so they, like they're not actually going out and killing these like the lion. You know, the pictures of the lions and tigers. Like, it's basically an entrapment where they can go and just murder an animal. Yeah. That's basically what this is. Go out. Be, you know, go out in the wild. Hunt. I, I don't respect it. <laughs> well, they did make the change. Uh, George R. R. Martin always said his biggest criticism of Game of Thrones was Robert out hunting with only three other people. That if the king hunts, there should be hundreds of men, there should be dogs, there should be food. Uh, so we got the sort of the majestic hunt here. Yeah. You know, the regal hunt. It's like in Parks and Rec when they go camping and Tom has the basically like a mansion set up. Yes. Right. I like that. <laughs> That's, uh, I would never go camping or hunting, but you know, set up a nice tent, make it a thing. I'd consider it. You're seeing the budget with, when it comes to things like that. You know, that's something that you don't get in season one because they just can't afford it. It's something that can almost go unnoticed because you're expecting it. It's the king. It's the royal family, right? They're going to have access to all these resources. You start to think about it. Oh, that's a nice little change that they're making from Game of Thrones to the House of the Dragon. A bit more kingly. Another thing about being king, like there's a big party going on and you just got to sit up on top of everyone and just say it, sit there. It's boring. Join the party, have some fun, but you just got to sit in your chair and drink. Yeah, that's, those are the responsibilities, right? He's not above duty. He's just got to sit there. They got to, you know, captures the unstable nature of the happenings in that tent where everything is in, you know, everything is supposed to be a celebration for Aegon, but there's, there's so many things happening beyond, uh, behind the scenes, things that he cannot hide. Like when he st- ends up blacking out on Rhaenyra and Otto's like, yo, everyone's looking at you. Or when he's sitting on the chair and he's just, whether he's drinking or chewing out Jason Lannister, or he's a mess. But I, I think the production value, the sets have been absolutely gorgeous. And combined with the music, it really just sets the stage. Like I said in the first review, the Shakespearean atmosphere of everything that's going on with this royal family. What do you think about the pug? We didn't talk about the pug. Pug was cute. Yeah. They confirmed that there are pugs in Westeros. Yeah. I, it's, I never knew that. <laughs> but I do. She had a couple of good comebacks in this episode. Do you think your second name day was as extravagant? I, I don't remember. Neither will Aegon. You can definitely tell she's just tired of it at this point where the look she gets it, it just gives off the vibe that like like i said it was like everyone knows that her succession's in doubt and they maybe don't even take her seriously or she's heir just in name but Aegon really is the heir and at this point i feel like she's it's just beating her up and that's why you see those outbursts and that rebellion and reluctance to kind of participate in these events or even put on a happy face and enjoy the festivities. And I think that relationship with Allison, too, with the, with the scenes we got between them, you know, obviously there's a disconnect there. They go from best friends to, I assume, just awkward family dinners, or even if they have any interaction at all. But that first scene when she's under the weirwood and, you know, Allison kind of just one-upping her and showing that she has the upper hand now. She is the, she is the queen. And she also knows her probably better than anybody else. Yeah. They're all asking, where's Rhaenyra? Where's Rhaenyra? It's Allison who knows where she's going to be under the God's Wood uh, reading because that's what we used to do. And I got to hang out with this guitarist. Well, I mean, to be vague about things, some of the criticisms that the book readers have had of Allison's character so far, I just want to say it, it's called character development. And also, Fire and Blood isn't an accurate account of these events. Mm hmm. So you can go and point to this and this and that, but this is this is what it is. I'm considering this confirmation of some of the things that are left up in the air. Right. And these characters have to... You're a different person at 18 than you were at 30. So... Or you're a different person at 30 than you were at 18. I'm sure if we saw earlier scenes of Cersei or Marjorie... Or, look at Sansa. Compare Sansa as a kid to Sansa in season 8. She's going toe-to-toe with the fucking mother of dragons. She don't give a fuck. In season 1, she's just this little girl who doesn't understand anything about the world you know it's they need to go through some things here <laughs> yeah especially so when they're like oh allison you know she's too nice she's a kid we talked about it too like i think on the preview just how these are 
all non-primary sources written by maesters. So like there is room for interpretation and things to play with. And, you know, some events aren't going to be as they were portrayed in those stories because, I mean, they're educated guesses, but at the end of the day, they're just based off of either secondhand accounts or memories or what what the gossip is. Right. And that gossip is always cranked up to 10. Right. So you can anticipate where some of these characters are going to go, but I don't mind getting these moments of development. You know, these are the, these are I think going to be important scenes that you look back on and think, man, maybe if the character would have ex- taken that olive olive branch that was extended, we wouldn't be at this point we are now. But I think these are very key and important scenes. And uh, the actress who is portraying Allison, I, th- I think, has been really good. You know, everyone keeps commenting on uh, complimenting Millie Alcock. I, th- I think she's arguably been just as strong. And you can Emily argue, Carey. and I think a lot of people are basing their dislike for Allison right now based off of what they might know or kind of how they perceive certain things or what they've read. But just watching this show in a vacuum, what has she done wrong? (laughs) You're a victim. Manipulated by her father at a very young age to seduce a king. Constantly. And then the king choosing to marry you, which you cannot say no to. Yeah, I mean, the way she's been picking at her fingers, she looks extremely nervous at the end of episode two when Viserys is about to make that announcement. It's not like she's she's not out here manifesting this shit, Mm -hmm. you know? Like we've said, she's a pawn. Uh, And so is Rhaenyra. And she's doing well for herself. Don't get me wrong. No, yeah, uh, 100%. She has a son that has a legit claim to the throne, and she's the queen. Yeah, and you know, Otto has definitely been the ickier of the two. But even that first scene when Otto's talking to Hobart, and he's kind of just like, listen, Rhaenyra's the heir. That's what Viserys thinks. And his brother's like, then you're not doing your job, bro. This is your job. And the way he calls Aegon our boy. Our boy's got a kingly presence to him, doesn't he? Uh, Just shit his pants, Otto. (laughs) Well, no, that was his brother saying that, yeah. Uh, Otto's the one who criticizes him for eating porridge with his hands. He's two. No, I like that. From, you expect <laughs> keeping him in line. Yeah, expect more from the king. <laughs> I saw another like or, like it's a uh, fork, you idiot. Criticism that there's no one really to latch onto as like a main favorite character, unlike many other like there's no Harry Potter or Luke Skywalker, John Snow, Ned John Stark. Snow. Yeah, I think who cares. Rhaeny- yeah, but like I think Rha- Rhaenyra has proven to be. I a think very, she's been yeah. that for a lot of people. And Lionel Strong. Right, but when you know when you watch Shakespeare, it's like, oh, who am I rooting for? Yeah, you're watching for the tragedy. You're rooting for Lionel Strong because he's the only one who just wants to do his job. And his sons, good kids. I like. He's one of the, he's one of the girls. <laughs> yeah, he is. Yeah, right. That would be me in that setting. <laughs> yeah, that's the same thing. I'm not fucking hunting. Are you out of your mind? It's be the right. most pampered piece of shit in all the they Seven got Kingdoms. Cake, they got tea, yeah. dogs. <laughs> Fucking Lady Redwin, what an asshole. Um, but you watch for the the tragedy and the betrayal and the backstabbing. Not everyone has to be, and you said it, Rhaenyra's kind of got the hero vibe to her, but not everyone has to be wholly good in order to make a show interesting. You can still, uh, I'm sure there's plenty of things that people can relate to with these characters. I mean, Damon's a perfect example of, he might end up being the best gray character Ever. this world has... That's a pretty bold statement, but just like apparently it's, he's George R. R. Martin's yes. favorite Targaryen. But a song, so. of, but I'm just saying, like within Game of Thrones, yeah, House no, of the there's, Dragon, there's like, some big ones, man. Jamie Lannister was always my favorite character because of that. But Jamie, great character for sure. But he goes from villain Gray to just he's a good guy by the end of the series. Cersei later on is probably a good example of that, especially during season six and post season six. But she's still very much painted as the villain and then you you know look at the hound but I, I, I stannis stannis is a bore <laughs> hey you don't have to tell me twice but damon like he's i don't think any of those characters i just named it saved maybe cersei for some people that you rooted for and were like hated at the same time none of them have have a dragon <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, the dragon helps a lot. Yes, yes, it certainly does. And his, like, kindness to Rhaenyra and right. the way he tries to help his brother. I mean, obviously, he's made mistakes, and the perfect example is him just well, showing him beat up a poor messenger, which I'm very anti. And imagine just yeah, too, up, reestablish imagine who's in charge. Imagine getting a notice to uh, vacate, and you beat up the mailman. Probably be arrested. Yeah. You're not arresting a guy with a dragon, sorry. No. He arrests you. But even him, like, Ned Stark would roll over, well, he's not born yet, but if he was, he would be disgusted. You're going to surrender, but then continue to fight? Oh, right, yeah, people were saying that 
It's a war crime. Well, the crab feeder isn't, you know. <laughs> People, I, I, I love that. I, I said it on the first review. It was cinematic. It was epic. Watching him just, like, Marshawn Lynch, just running into these guys, beating the fucking crap out of them. Dark I sister. thought it was well-directed. Yeah, Dark Sister. It doesn't, there's no indication that it could be Longclaw. Hopefully, they'll eventually just look into the camera and say it's, it's Longclaw. A lot of people didn't like the way that they don't show the fight with Kragger. I thought leaving that up to the ima- imagination was pretty well done. It doesn't Kragger, always work, but I think it works there. He yeah, looks like a weak villain. Yeah, and he never like struck me as someone who's going to stand up and shoot the one with Damon and have a chance of winning. <laughs> yeah, and they confirmed that he's wearing a... Uh, it's something I noticed, but I guess we just never brought it up. Uh, yeah, the harpy mask. The harpy mask. It was a satisfying ending because of not only the design, but what he was doing. It was just satisfied to see him die you know, I think you in could that do like a, brutal brutal way you could have done a whole bottle episode of Cragger he would have been a horrifying like horror villain like he's someone you see in a horror movie like fuck that yeah. guy I don't want to be anywhere near him but when push comes to shove he's not he's gonna stand up to Damon Targaryen without getting split in half yeah to me that was the be- that was the better way to do it all the men see him dragging out that body Corliss sees him so that's how the story is going to spread they're gonna talk about Damon's incredible victory where he definitely didn't commit any war crimes and uh, obviously you have Laner coming back on on the dragon are there war crimes in medieval times I don't think so I think some people were confused about whose dragon that is and who the hell is Laner and why does Laner get a dragon so I guess those are some things we could clear up he's a son of Rhaenys Targaryen so when you have that blood when you have when you have one parent that's a Targaryen chances are you're gonna get a dragon so yeah. that's his dragon sea smoke and that's something that they even the Valyrian blood Valerian Valyrian have Valyrian blood that's still that doesn't work well in my brain Right. Well, there are no pure Valerians with dragons at yes. this time. Um, but I'm just saying, like, like, if you want to go, you know, I think the blood does help some okay. of those connections. But yeah, we see him in the first episode at the tourney. He's much younger. But uh, yeah, he's Rainey's and Corliss' son. <laughs> they, did, they did age him up without telling anybody. Well, they have to do it. He his growth spurt. Yeah, he had his growth spurt, right? Yeah. Rhaenyra's going to see him and be like, whoa, yeah, maybe we should get married. And your dragon's pretty hot, too. But they've, uh, they've, made an effort to make the dragons look different. They have distinct appearances. They have, it's almost like they fit the personality of the rider. So Damon's a bit unhinged, unbalanced, unpredictable. I think Caraxes represents that really well. And with, you know, we don't know much about Lanor, but he does have this, he's got a regalness to him as well that Rhaenyra sort of has. And Sea Smoke is more of a traditional looking dragon. But I think the the white scales, you know, it looks like somebody who's a seafarer would have that sort of dragon, you know? Yeah, some people were confused. Oh, does Damon have two dragons? And he just lended one out? Well, I thought it might have been Caraxes at first, but measured the neck. Like, oh, you got your neck done? Nope. Different dragon. But I, I think the way that was all set up was, like I said, it was so well done to not have him speak for the entire episode. <laughs> Somebody commented that the crab feeder doesn't speak for three episodes. So it's just the battle between the unspokens. Uh, he just goes straight for it, you know, not even telling them what the hell he's going to do. They know. It's that sort of unspoken communication of it all. And maybe, I, I don't know, maybe it could have been constructed in a smarter way. Yeah. But I when think- I was watching it, I was having fun. And that's, yeah. that's what matters to me. There are a couple moments where, like, he legit stops, fights somebody. And, like, I thought he was going to use one of the guys as a meat shield, but he's just out in the open in the same spot. And, um, yeah, a little more attention to detail, crafting it in a way where it is a bit strategic with his movements. He's dipping and dodging a little bit, but, you know, you got a bunch of archers. And they do get him at the end, which I think kind of saved it for me, but uh, just a little bit. He's gotten fucked up a couple of times because he gets hit with one in the beginning. Yeah. And that's when they fly away, and then he gets hit with one at the end. Dude's got really heavy plot armor. But I don't care because he's a vibe. I just like the whole character, man. And I can't believe that this this casting has been controversial. I think Matt Smith has been... I think this is sort of just adding to his legacy because he's obviously been in bigger projects before, but now being in such a popular show and being a fan favorite, it's just awesome to see, you know, him him kind of carve out his, his film legacy here. If it keeps going in this way, like you said, he could be one of the best characters that this world has produced, uh, at least in live action. Just the look of him at the end, you know, that face, he's, <laughs> he's just a good-ass actor. He's really just committed to this role. He's so believable as this. He's so believable as this character. Oh yeah, I think it's a perfect casting. And yeah, definitely, I think people were pointing out the parallels of both Targaryen, well, Damon and Rhaenyra, just covered in blood. It's uh, definitely a look. <laughs> yeah, it does. It looks good on them. Definitely, yeah. The blood, not so much the fire. But I wonder if they're all immune now. 
because of what they've done with Daenerys. They do have that one shot in episode one of Viserys holding his hand over the flames and he doesn't seem to be too bothered by it. So I you wonder think, if that's something they'll introduce. I think that's a blessing and a curse. How so? I don't know. Sometimes you just want to go outside a nice warm day, feel the heat. They don't get that. Are they always cold? No, I think they feel the heat. It just can't hurt them. There's probably a limit, you know? Put your hand on the fire. It just feels feels good. What if you're doesn't kill you? What if you're enjoying a nice bowl of soup and you have you have a buddy with you? Who's, oh, it looks good. Oh, here, try some. He tries it. It's been boiling hot the whole time. He just burned his buddy's tongue off. I think that's gonna be the that's gonna be the other spinoff that happens in that one. Could be a plot hole that they run into. Yeah. <laughs> just saying. You gotta be wary. I wonder what the, like the reaction. Obviously, I don't know if you saw the preview, but I still haven't seen the preview. No. No. <laughs> there gonna be a lot there. Yeah. He's definitely getting praise for his victory. Um, I think he's being called King of the Narrow Sea. That doesn't sound like it's going to stick. Well, that's the title of the next episode, King of the Narrow Sea. So I, his, his stock's going up. His popularity is probably building. Um, Viserys choosing not to name Aegon as an heir. Everyone... I'm like, oh, it must be Damon then, right? Because Damon just had that great victory. So you're well, going to yeah, go back like, well, and we're gonna he's going to have popular the now. first queen in the king, uh, history of the Seven Kingdoms. Do we want Aegon, who's a baby and whose own father doesn't think he should be heir? Or Damon? Just kicking ass. They left out the surrender part. No one knows that. <laughs> no, no, they're going to keep that. They're going to keep that in the documents. Those documents are in Mar-a-Lago. Yeah, it makes it interesting. It adds a new wrinkle. And I've gotten such a kick out of some of the predictions people have been making on social media. It's just fun to watch, you know? At this point, it, it's it, there's definitely hints as to where the story is going, but it, it isn't so clear, especially for those who haven't read the book. And uh, like I said, that adds a new wrinkle into the debates uh, over succession, over who's worthy, over who makes the most sense. And at this point, it's looking like Lanor. <laughs> that man was going off, too. I feel like if you have a dragon, you're automatically, like, you're just into running. Yeah. Maybe a step down, right? You'd just be a regular guy with a dragon. Oh, yeah. I mean, if I had a dragon, I don't know what I would do with it, but I would definitely, like, I don't know. I would feel invincible. I'd be rolling up to the club every night. With the dragon? It's like bringing a whip out, you know? Yeah, you gotta find the right valet. (laughs) Yeah, that is true. Someone with Valyrian blood. Oh, just lost the third guy this month. Try not to scratch it. Yeah, right. I don't know why. Toss him the... Tossing him there, sir. They don't have keys. Well, I guess we could talk about this, too. Uh, The news that Miguel Sapochnik is leaving as a showrunner for season two. Leaving it in the hands of Ryan J. Condal, who has been the second showrunner for season one. But, you know, it's, it's gotten people talking about the future of the show, the reasons why he left... Me personally, I'm hoping it's just he's finally developing his passion project or Disney's offered him Avengers 6. And, uh, you know, there's just better prospects. You know, there's more money to be made. Or, like I said, a passion project. He's been on TV for a long time now. And this is no easy task to run a show of this size. So maybe he just also feels confident in Condal's abilities and he's a bit burnt out. From what I gathered from his statements and kind of just projecting here, but doing eight seasons of Game of Thrones and coming back and to this world and it's a lot of work, a lot of pressure and yeah, I think as a creative, you know, you see a lot of actors after they're done with their shows they want to try something else and he's kind of just was not pushed back because he obviously he wanted to do this but maybe he just has desires to do other things besides stick in this world and I don't think this necessarily closes the door with him directing future episodes but not being so involved, taking a step back and kind of just focusing on other things. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It's obviously a shame because you are losing one of the better directors working. I mean, uh, you can put a, you can just say television, but I think considering his work and his resume up, is pretty yeah, fucking elite. So yeah, I think just across all uh, mediums. So that does that does hurt. But um, I think there's a difference between directing and being a full-time showrunner, trying to do both is probably a lot of work. Right, and it does tie you up if there are other opportunities knocking that he can't necessarily take because he's on as a showrunner for one of the biggest shows in the world. And I'd much rather prefer someone who's not fully locked in, taking a step back, letting other people do it, than continuing it if your heart's not in it. It is unfortunate because the nature of the story 
is setting up so many battles, you think that he's just the perfect guy to direct some of these bigger episodes when things really start to pop off. And maybe they do eventually bring him back for an episode or two. That's Like I said, depending on what he does next, he may be too big for that. His schedule may be packed, and I, I really hope it is that. But we'll see. If there's, you know, if there's a noticeable dip between Season 1 and Season 2, Condal's going to become an easy target. Yeah. Which would suck, but hey, I guess it's it's just in his hands at this point. But it was definitely a shock. You know, some of the actors said that it was a shock as well. It's not something that they anticipated. It's a story that sort of just dropped in between episodes one and two. And, yeah. Or episodes two and three now. Uh, caught a lot of people by surprise. Fans, actors, really everyone. Me? Aaron Judge has hit another home run. No fucking way. <laughs> no f- my goodness. Do you hear the rumors about Henry Cavill? And Elizabeth Olsen. And El- <laughs> that is, that's interesting because you're starting season one, some familiar faces, Matt Smith, probably the biggest one. And these are all rumors. I wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be shocked if nothing comes out of this. And I expect nothing to come out of this. But if you bring in two heavy hitters like that for your season two, I'm getting chills just talking about it. You know, those are two big presences incredible it's more so you know you're hyped to see them but for them to sink their teeth in this material you know Mm -hmm. this could be some of the best work that they do with their careers if it ends up coming true it probably won't but just seeing those rumors got me excited seeing like elizabeth olsen in this world will be like my dream come true it's my two favorite things coming together but she has to be wanda wow you replaced uh, amy adams god damn Oh, no, she's still there. Okay. But you said two favorite things. I have a lot of favorite things. Two of my favorite things. <laughs> Fine. Yeah. She, you know what? She would have been perfect for uh, as Allison, as an older Allison. Yeah. yeah. Without a doubt. Well, she's American, right? So that's... Oh, right. Yeah. Does she do an English accent in anything? I feel like she could pull it off. Her Russian accent was god-awful. <laughs> um, so hopefully... I'll they... spin zone anything for that woman. So I think, what, Peter Dinklage, right? The only American from that original cast? Oberon. Yes, but uh, yeah, okay. The Dornish, though, accent type. It's a different, it's not an English accent, but right. yeah, okay. Yeah, I would love, even if, if honestly, like obvi- like you said, it's rumors. If we get one of them, I'll be pretty stoked. Because <laughs> they're both really good. I think Wanda's, pro- uh, Wanda, <laughs> Elizabeth Olsen's proven with WandaVision, like she can lead big IP and be very, very, very effective doing it. Um, and Henry Cavill, I feel bad for him just with everything going on with like dc and superman and him being in limbo when it comes to that but with everything else he's done i've, I've been impressed i think he's continuing to grow as an actor i think he has amazing screen presence and he just looks like he would fit in that world he was in the um i mean look at the witcher hair man yeah you know well that's what everyone's doing the photoshops Targaryen. are so easy i mean everyone's like oh like because you have the witcher like oh you could play tar- this targaryen that targaryen um i've always he's got a much better way baratheon like young robert Hey man, Craig those Baratheons Stark, may... That's what some people are saying. Like... Ooh, yeah, that could be interesting. That's a fucking Stark. Actually, you know what? He's too much of a Stark. I don't know if I can handle that. He would ruin Rob for me. <laughs> yeah, knowing that Rob, Rob all of a sudden becomes insecure, you know? Like, god damn, I gotta live up to that. So, there's so many... I mean, it would have been so great to see him as uh, Aegon the Conqueror, or it would be yeah. great to see it, because you believe that this is a man... You know, you see him on screen. This is a man who could conquer an entire continent on the back of a dragon with his two sister wives. It's just very believable when you get a guy like that. But a, a Baratheon would be fun as well. I mean, you you uh, probably always wanted him as Robert Baratheon. You yeah, know, yeah, for Robert's Rebellion. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That oh, him with the that Warhammer. <laughs> oh my God. See, I wouldn't mind even Chris Hemsworth as a Robert Baratheon. Uh, I think with Thor, he's shown that he's he can kind of capture that youthful goofiness that Robert probably had. He was a fighter. He was a killer. But I'm sure he'd like to have a good time. You could see it with him as, as an old man as well, you know? Cavill, to me, he's he's not the best actor, but he is a presence, like you said. So maybe some of his deficiencies as an actor, you, you can forgive them when he's just a soft-spoken conqueror type of character. But he's been... I think Man from Uncle. Even um, you keep going back to that man. He's got to. He's got to show me something else. Mission Impossible. Get him in Bond. I think in Fallout. But right, Mission Impossible. But, but you're selling the fists. You're not selling the Shakespearean dialogue here. Yes, but before he's like the villain, like I think he has a swagger to him that is. It's got a swagger. Yeah, it's yeah. not Geralt where he's all stern and steady, no. or Superman where he has no emotion. Right. Yeah. Classic Superman. <laughs> that old Superman that we all know and love. <laughs> yeah. 
fucking doorknob. Uh, well, he's done a good job sort of in between the Supermans, building his resume, and I think becoming a bigger star. Yeah. So now it's like, if you want me back for Superman, it's going to be a big movie. I'll go to Marvel. And his natural charisma, you see him in interviews or just talking like on press junkets or even when he's building like a computer, like shit like that. <laughs> he's very, very charismatic and likable. Comes off as just a genuine person. If, even if he's playing Henry Cavill, you can put him in different roles. So he doesn't have to just be um, a Targaryen or a stern character. He can be a fun-loving, goofy guy from up north. Just like Jon Snow. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, the moment between Alicent and Viserys, once again, it's another moment that establishes Alicent as a level-headed character. She's giving Viserys some good advice here. So you have the good advice from Lionel Strong, and we commented that on the first video, but it is Alicent who tells her, who tells him, maybe it's the right move to send some support here. So it's just uh, opening up these characters and showing, you know, where they, you know, where their hearts are when it comes to certain matters. And I think those scenes, those smaller moments do go a long way. Yeah, I think a common thread that, you know, Game of Thrones and this show seem to have is just how, how fast some of these characters are able to, like, lose their innocence when they're in this world and just in the mud with everything going on. Obviously, throughout the years with Sansa and Arya, uh, brand we kind of seen it we saw it play out over some years here they're kind of skipping so you kind of have to fill in the, the dots your own and you, you see how these characters have matured over these years and they're not you know 17 you know nowadays when we look at 17 year old they're fucking children here they're much more mature and they have to take on bigger roles and make bigger decisions and they can't afford to be children anymore. Yeah, and what a contrast between Allison's advice and the advice that Otto is trying to push onto Viserys throughout the episode, especially the moment. Uh, a lot of people got a kick out of that when, you know, we can solve this by just wedding your daughter to your two-year-old son. Uh, <laughs> and he, uh, you know, Otto also has a scene with his daughter where he, you know, he's he gets Allison involved in this as well. So <laughs> You make the decision, daughter. I'll pick the baby. What? <laughs> right. <laughs> Otto's just in the back like, I win again. We should just do like a Bachelor where it's Laner, Damon, Kristen Cole. She just picks. And Aegon. And Aegon. Yeah. Yep. Played by Ike from South Park. <laughs> Be like Ike and his kindergarten teacher. Aegon, I'm going to have to send you home because you're a baby. <laughs> And even, uh, you know, the we, we mentioned Rhaenyra and Kristen Cole, but their relationship, they those two characters have a lot of chemistry. So I think that they're going to tease fans. They're going to set fans up for an expectation that they should get together. It's not even, do you think they're going to get together? It's, I want them to get together. Because they kind of sort of look good as a couple, you know, when they're walking and talking. I definitely appreciated that aspect of their relationship in this I episode. I never got the vows of, like, the Night's Watch and the Kingsguard. It's like, just let them have sex. Well, Sam actually points out, it's like, well, he said no father, no children. So as long as you pull a game, pull out games. I mean, they're all it. fucking. I know. Come on. I know. But just to have that as a rule, just supposed mean. to keep you're supposed to keep your focus. Not if you're on all your backed up. If you're all backed up, how are you gonna focus on Bro, your job? Look at J- Jamie you're Lannister see- wasn't even doing anything season one. He was on the King's Guard just kicking back fucking Cersei the whole time. He had no responsibilities. <laughs> I don't know. You don't think Barristan was like... Barristan, no. Barristan never did. Especially just seeing Robert just bring in woman after woman after woman. He's just sitting there listening. I'm sure Barristan got his here and there. I mean, he was anointed at what? How old? <laughs> Let me just look in my uh, nights in my white like book. 15? <laughs> I think it was 15. I'm sure he was fine. Wait, no, that could have been... G- no, Jamie well, was... what do they say? You don't use it, you lose it. So eventually you just get over it. That's what happened to Varys. He made up the whole <laughs> sorcerer thing. He just... Couldn't have said. No. He just wasn't fucking. He's just dedicated to the grind. Yeah. All right, guys, that does it for this uh, spoiler discussion of House of the Dragon. Episode three, second of his name. Uh, it's always fun to talk about House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones content. You know, this is, some people would say this is what we do best, but. I mean. My mom says that. Who's her favorite character? Uh, So far in this? Yeah. I don't think she has one. <laughs> she hasn't mentioned any favorite characters, but she did have a prediction that, uh. Chris and Cole and Rhaenyra are going to get married. And I had to, you know, push up my glasses. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, technically, Bob, because he's a member of the King's Guard. He can't fuck. Damn, we were making some good points in that video. Hey guys, Aaron and Nerd Suit Monkey here. Before we end this video, I want to give a quick shout out to our Patreon supporters. What can I say about you guys that I haven't already said about myself? You are the most important part of the channel and the main reason we keep going strong. Like Bo says, you keep the lights on in the fridge, so the fridge is full. 
or, or something like that. So, from everyone here at Nerd Soup, I'd like to thank you guys for your continued support. If you're interested in joining the ranks of our patron supporters, head over to patreon.com slash nerdsoup and check out the rewards we offer to our patrons. We recently dropped some new stickers for you guys to check out, or you could choose a tier that will allow you to select a movie, show, or video game for us to review. We've got a full slate of fan-suggested reviews coming your way, and we're really excited about the chance to review some of those movies and shows. We've also got t-shirts, mugs, behind-the-scenes videos showing how we bring our videos to life. And once again, thank you to all our Patreon pledgers who have been supporting us throughout the years. Without you, we wouldn't be able to convert all your pledges into cryptocurrency, so thank you from my future self for making us broke. broke.